Good evening. I am some Maven of the Eventide. And what do you do when you're stuck indoors for weeks and months on end? Read more vampire books. I have acquired a whole bunch of new vampire books. Some of them sent to me by you. Thank you so much. But many of them used that I received because my fabulous mother had a friend who was giving away an entire library and many of the books in that library were vampire books. So she messages me and she's like, hey, do you want all these vampire books? And I said, yes, I do. So several weeks later, once it was safe to go to the post office again, two crates of vampire books arrived on my doorstep. So now I'm going to share them with you. Not in any particular order, kind of arranged by size. I've ran out of room on my bookshelves, so I'm getting a new bookshelf soon to put all these new vampire books in. So for right now, they're just in stacks. I'm living in a giant stack of books, much like Lestat did in the Vampire Lestat to the 1920s when his house just became wall-to-wall -wall books. Lestat reads... So these were sent to me by a very lovely person. The first three others novels, written in red by Anne Bishop, Murder of Crows, Vision in Silver. These are urban fantasy novels. Relatively new, came out in the past decade. Here's the summary of the first one. Enter a world inhabited by the others. Unearthly entities, vampires, and shapeshifters among them who rule the earth and whose prey are humans. As a Cassandra Sangui, or blood prophet, Meg Corbin can see the future when her skin is cut, a gift that feels more like a curse. Meg's controller keeps her enslaved so he can have full access to her visions. But when she escapes, the only safe place Meg can hide is at the Lakeside Courtyard, a business district operated by the others. Intriguing. Thank you for sending these to me. Peeps by Scott Westerfield, also known as the author of Uglies. Okay, let's clear up some myths about vampires. First of all, you won't see me using the V word much. In the Night Watch, we prefer the term parasite positives, or peeps for short. The main thing to remember is that there's no magic involved. No flying, no transforming into bats or rats either. We're talking about a disease. After a chance encounter with a mysterious woman one night, Cat Thompson's life has changed forever. He's been infected with an insidious parasite. The good news, he's only a carrier, still sane without the worst of the symptoms. The bad news, he's infected all his former girlfriends, and now they've turned into what Cat calls peeps. The rest of us call them vampires, and it's Cal's job. Oh, it's Cal, not Cat. This is a very weird font. I thought Cat was kind of a cool name for a guy, but his name is Cal. It's Cal's job to hunt them down before they create even more of their kind. The first quote on here is, even non-vampire fans will like this one. Exceptional. Because everyone knows vampire books are so passe. When did this come out? 2005. So yeah, it was written pre-Twilight, just before the vampire revival. So, you know, even vampire fans will like this one. I've never even heard of this. I am curious. V Wars by Jonathan Mayberry, which you may have heard of because it was made into a TV show recently on Netflix, I believe, which you can watch, which I haven't yet, but people keep asking me about it. They are already here. They hide among us. They hunt us. They feed on us. They are us. V Wars is the chronicle of the first vampire war, from the savage murders committed by patient zero of the plague to full-out battles with vampire terrorist cells. These are the stories of the most terrifying war mankind has ever faced. Vampire wars have begun. The world will scream. I wonder how similar it is to World War Z. Probably not in format, but in, you know, like basic wartime premise concept. Interesting. Should I read this book first or should I watch the show first? This is a three CD set. I've actually owned this for years and I completely forgot about it because who uses CDs anymore? But I was going through my old CD collection, like dusting them off and I found it. And I should have shown this to you ages ago, but I forgot I had it. Classic Tales of Terror plus Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I guess is not a tale of terror, but it includes Dracula. So it's the werewolf, Frankenstein, Dracula, and Jekyll and Hyde, Monsters of the Night, complete and unedited, classic tales of terror. Obviously, it's not going to be uh, the full book of Dracula. What is it? 
Oh, Adventures in Old Time Radio. So it's the old radio play, Dracula starring Orson Welles. Original radio adaptation. Orson Welles selected Bram Stoker's Dracula for a premiere broadcast of his legendary radio series, The Mercury Theater on the Air, hailing the 1897 gothic novel as the best story of its kind ever written. I've owned this for years and never actually listened to it. Orson Welles doing Dracula. Gotta see this. Also, why is the werewolf? Is it based on a book? A young boy relates the tale of a white wolf and the strange curse which has befallen an Eastern European family. I've never heard of this story. What's this based on? The interesting thing about the werewolf in the monster pantheon of when you think of universal horrors, Dracula, Phantom of the Opera, the wolf man, creature from the Black Lagoon, Frankenstein, like that whole club of monster Disney princesses is the werewolf isn't based on like a classic gothic novel. There's a lot of werewolf legends and lore in the book of werewolves, which Bram Stoker uses inspiration for Dracula, but there's no like one werewolf character. That's the main thing. So if this is based on something like that, I'd like to know because that would be really useful knowledge for my monster agenda. A copy of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter by Seth Graham Smith, author of Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which someone sent me. They said they didn't know if I already had it, but they were sending it to me anyway. Thank you. Seth Graham Smith tells a story of how he came up with this, that he went into like a Barnes and Noble one February and it was during the Twilight craze. So they had that big front table with all the vampire books spread out. But because it was February, they also had a big table with like President's Day stuff spread out. And he was looking at the vampire table and the President's table and he was like, huh, what if I put my two hands together? What would that book be? And he came out with Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, which... I never thought was a very well-written book. I'm not a big fan of his writing. I like his ideas, but not his prose. But the movie was pretty cool. I liked the movie, which I said so a long time ago on Vampire Reviews. Insatiable by Meg Cabot. It's got a sexy lady with a stake in her hand wearing a red dress. The master of her genre. Oh, look, there's a big picture of the author on the back. No biting, it says. Sick of hearing about vampires? Never. So is Mina Harper. Oh, spelled M-E-E-N-A, Harper. Not, not, not Mina Harker from Dracula. No, Mina Harper. But her bosses are making her write about them anyway, even though Mina doesn't believe in them. Not that Mina isn't familiar with these supernaturals. See, Mina Harper knows how you're going to die. Not that you're going to believe her. No one ever does. So she's like a prophet. But not even Mina's precognition can prepare her for what happens when she meets, then makes the mistake of falling in love with Lucian Antonescu, a modern-day prince with a bit of a dark side. It's a dark side a lot of people, like an ancient society of vampire hunters, would prefer to see him dead for. The problem is, Lucian's already dead. Of course he is. Maybe that's why he's the first guy Mina's ever met whom she could see herself having a future with. See, Mina's always been able to see everyone else's future. She's never been able to look into her, her own. And while Lucian seems like everything Mina has ever dreamed of in a boyfriend, he might turn out to be more like a nightmare. Now might be a good time for Mina to start learning to predict her own future. If she even has one. So, uh, vampire romance. I like this hardcover edition. This came out in 2010, so definitely right in that Twilight craze. You know, Twilight did not serve the adult market. It did not hit adult romance feels. So vampire romance for everyone who wishes there was romance for them. 100 Vicious Little Vampire Stories. I have the 100 Wicked Little Witch Stories, but I never actually own the 100 Vicious Little Vampire Stories from this collection. What is a vampire? Evil incarnate? A creature in the Dracula vein whose gruesome means of sustenance contradicts the norms by which civilized human beings measure what is natural and morally proper? Or is a vampire with his nocturnal habits a potent symbol for humanity's unenlightened superstitions? A counter symbol of the divinity who turned the darkness into the void into light? As the tales and 100 vicious little vampire stories make clear, there is no simple answer to the question, what is a vampire? For in this volume, no two vampires are alike. So if it's anything like 100 Wicked Little Witch Stories, it is just an anthology of stories written by contemporary authors with different takes on vampires, trying to explore new angles, fresh angles of vampires that you don't see often. So I'm really excited to read this. This series is from the 90s. Uh, 1995, it's uh, published by Barnes & Noble Books, back when they used to do, like, innovative things. 
Not a vampire thing, but sent to me by the lovely person who sent me the books is their own book called I Scare My Own Family, Tales and Poems of a Twisted Mind by Kelly Michelle. Thank you for sending me this twisted person to my twisted show. Take a trip into the darkness with these twisted tales. On your journey, you'll meet mischievous ghosts, deadly creatures, and you'll witness the depths of true evil. Once darkness falls, light a candle and enjoy 17 tales of fright and the unknown. Just don't look up when you hear that bump in the night. You never know what might be looking back. A hardback copy of Vittorio the Vampire by Anne Rice. I've only ever had a paperback copy of this before. This was included in the case of books that my mother sent me. The entire library that she was sending me included all the hardback editions of Anne Rice's books, but I actually already owned most of them, so I told her to, you know, give them to someone else who needed them. But this one I didn't, so she sent me this one. Vittorio the Vampire is one of the tales of the new vampires that Anne Rice wrote, which I never got why they were different from the regular vampires because the first one in it is Pandora, and she's a canon regular vampire. Like, she's involved in a lot of the main books. Even, like, in Queen of the Damned, she has a big part. But Vittorio is an entirely useless, pointless vampire that nobody cares about who appears for this one book, and then never again except for a brief cameo and not even by name. So this book could be completely cut out of the canon of the series. You would never have to read this to understand anything else in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. Oh, speaking of which, have you heard Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles television series, which has been in the works for like three years now, has found a new home. It was going to be on Hulu, and then they lost that contract, and Brian Fuller was going to direct it or headline it, and then he walked away. But now they're going to be on AMC TV Network. So yay! It's actually happening! I knew it would happen. And the Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles television series is going to incorporate the Mayfair Witches series into one big expanded supernatural universe of vampires and witches together because why not? You gotta fill up a TV series somehow. But I kind of doubt Vittorio the Vampire will make an appearance because this entire story is set in oldie times in like the 1500s or something and it never intersects with any of the other stories and Nobody remember or cares about Vittorio. It's actually kind of a, not a very well-written book. It's very sparse. It kind of reads like a first draft with just a bunch of like loose ideas without any like fleshing out. It's very short. It's very easy to read, but I was disappointed with this book when I read it, but it is very pretty. And I like having this, you know, tiny little hardback copy to fit on my shelf with the rest of my books. Then I got hardback copies of Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis, and Blood Communion, the newest Vampire Chronicle. I had read these books in ebook form, but I never actually owned them. And my father sent me these for my birthday. So thank you, Dad. Now I actually have them. And now I actually own hardback copies of every single one of Anne Rice's vampire books. My collection is complete. Until she writes another one. Yes, Anne Rice, Prince Lestat, and the Realms of Atlantis is the weird one where it turns out all vampires are descended from aliens who are also the rulers of ancient Atlantis. But Blood Communion, the one that just came out last year, is it's actually pretty cool. Like, the first half of it is pretty cool. It's actually a really short book. So, like, this much of the book is good and exciting. And, like, there's high stakes and you're scared that characters you love will die and stuff. And then the rest of the book, this much of the book, they um, plan a party and then they have the party. That's, that's pretty It was fun. They're all fun. That's why we read them. Speaking of Anne Rice, not vampire books, but since my mom was just giving them away, I said, send them to me too. I got a copy of Anne Rice's The Mummy, which I've owned and read, but I only had like the mass market paperback. So this is the nice big paperback, which The Mummy is not a vampire. And I like this book because it reminded me a lot of like Agatha Christie novels, kind of like 1920s set Egyptology nonsense. That was a fun read. Hardback copy is Servant of the Bones, which is almost more like a genie novel. This is a weird one. I haven't actually read it, so I'll read it and tell you more. Never owned it, never read it. Taltos, the third in the Mayfair Witches novels. I read the first two and owned the first two, but after the second one, I was just like, I'm done. He's too weird. The Taltos, just weird nonsense. A lot of like weird, creepy child sex stuff that I'm just like, eh. But now I own it, so my collection can be complete. I don't know if I'll ever read this one. Then Anne Rice's son's books, A Density of Souls and The Snow Garden. 
And I had read The Density of Souls, an ebook before. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, it's a lot of like New Orleans gothic. No vampires, nothing supernatural, but he's a pretty good writer, and I really liked his book. Christopher Rice, Anne Rice's Son, and another one of his books, The Snow Garden, which I haven't read yet, so looking forward to this one. Not vampires, but worth mentioning while we're on the subject. But back to vampires. I have, which was also sent to me by my father for my birthday, or maybe my brother. My brother also sent me a bunch of books. Between my father and my brother, I got 16 books for my birthday, which was last week. So thank you. This is Grave Importance by Vivian Shaw. It is the third in the Dr. Greta Helsing novel series, and I liked both the first and the second, which I talked to you about already. The main characters include Varney the Vampire and Lord Rutherford from Polydori's The Vampire as main characters with Dr. Greta Helsing, who is their doctor to the supernatural. And the second book was all about vampires. Greta gets kidnapped by vampires and has to, like, escape them. This one looks like it's about a mummy, and I remember there being, like, teaser bait with a mummy at the end of the other one, but those other vampires are still going to be in here, and I'm looking forward to reading it because I really enjoyed the first two books. I Killers, a novel by A.A. A. Carr, this was recommended to me by someone in my Discord when we were talking about vampire books. It's a University of Oklahoma press book, and it's part of a series about Native American legends and stories. And Eye Killers is the one that's part of the series. I think it's like number 15 in the series, but it's the one that focuses on vampires. Lurking in the caves of eastern New Mexico, Falky, a thousand-year-old vampire, chooses his next bride. Melissa Roanhorse, an Albuquerque teenager. To regain his granddaughter's life, Michael Roanhorse, an old Navajo sheep herder, wise to the power of the myth, must outwit the vampire and his loyal coven. So begins Eye Killers, a novel that combines the Eastern European legend of the vampire with the Navajo tale of the monster slayer. I have not read any vampire fiction written by a Navajo person using any Navajo lore. So this will be exciting. Thank you to the person who recommended it to me. I put it on my wish list and then wound up getting it for my birthday. Thank you so much. A copy of Necroscope by Brian Lumley. I have been looking for this book everywhere. I first read this book about 15 years ago, maybe longer, maybe like almost 20 years ago. Uh, I borrowed it from a friend and read it, and that was a mass market paperback. I distinctly remember that small book. And I've never owned it, but now that I'm collecting vampire books, I want a copy from my library since I have actually read it. I've only read this, which is the first in the series. There's a lot more books. It's kind of hard to find. You can find the ebooks online easily, but finding these print books, they're out of print, and this is in such good condition. Even the back says, It's been more than 20 years since Brian Lundley unleashed Necroscope on Innocent Unsuspecting World. 20 years since our image of the vampire was forever changed from the urbane creature that just happened to like to drink blood into a lustful, blood-guzzling, metamorphic alien eager to turn men and women into chattel or livestock. So it is not a romantic kind of vampire. A lot of times, at least in the past when people have said to me, I don't like the romantic girly vampires that are written for a female audience. Do you have anything that's good for a guy to read? And you know, after I roll my eyes and pat their head, I recommend... Necroscope is usually one of the first things I can recommend. Some people have compared the vampires in this to the vampires in Guillermo del Toro's The Strain. Similar, it's debatable which came first since he'd been developing that for so long. I don't think he ripped this off, but there, there are similarities. So if you like that kind of grotesque, monstrous, gross horror show vampires, this book might be for you. And I do remember it being a fun read, very dude-tastic if that's what you're into. The Passage by Justin Cronin, also given to me for my birthday from my father, who went to my vampire wish list on Amazon and just, like, looked up all the books there and just sent me half of them. Um, this was recommended to me, and then the, someone saw it being recommended to me and said, no, don't read that, it's terrible. So I have got mixed things about this book. I don't really know anything about it beyond that. I just add it to my wish list when someone recommends me a vampire book. It happened fast. 32 minutes for one world to die, another to be reborn. First, the unthinkable. A security breach at a secret U.S. government facility unleashes the monstrous product of a chilling military experiment. Then the unspeakable. A night of chaos and carnage gives way to sunrise on a nation and ultimately a world forever altered. All that remains for the stunned survivors is a long fight ahead and a future ruled by fear of darkness, of death, and of fate far worse. 
As civilization swiftly crumbles into the primal landscape of predators and prey, two people flee in search of sanctuary. FBI agent Brad Wolgas is a good man haunted by what he's done in the line of duty. Six-year-old orphan Amy Harper Belafonte is a refugee from the doomed scientific project that has triggered apocalypse. Wolgas is determined to protect her from the horror set loose by her captors, but for Amy, escaping the bloody fallout is the only beginning of a much longer odyssey, spanning miles and decades toward the time and place where she must finish what should never have begun. Military apocalyptic vampire novel. I'm assuming the horror unleashed by the government was a secret vampire of some sort. Heard mixed things. We shall see. Vampires! Two centuries of great vampire stories, edited by Alan Ryan, with some great Edward Gorey-esque artwork on here. This is an anthology of vampire stories. A lot of public domain stuff in To Fill It Up, but also a lot more more contemporary stuff. There's a lot of stuff from the 1930s and 40s and 50s in here, 80s. The most recent one in here is Tanith Lee's Bite Me or Not from 1984. I get the feeling this book is probably about that old. The author has one of his, I mean, the editor has one of his own stories in here. So 1987 is when this came out. Hey, the jacket design actually is Edward Gorey. It's not Edward Gorey knockoff. He actually did it. I just mentioned this book recently in my video that I did about Dracula's guest, which if you are on my Patreon, you probably already watched. Or if you're watching this later, maybe you've seen it here on YouTube. But it does include Dracula's guests and a lot of other public domain stories from the same collection, not vampires, but worth noting because they match and I like coordination. This is a collection of ghost stories and masterpieces of terror and the supernatural. These have a different editor. These were Marvin Kay was the editor, but they have the same Edward Gorey jacket art. So they're really cool and they need to stay together on the shelf. Vampires, ghosts, and tales of terror. This came from that library collection that my mother sent me. So many good things. Also from that same collection, the first six books in the Cirque de Freak series, which I do already have. Well, I don't have the first three. I have the first three in graphic novel form, but I, four, five, and six that someone sent me in book form, but I don't have the first three. I thought when my mom was sending me these that they would match, but I've got one and two and six in hardback and three, four, and five in paperback. And that's a little bit frustrating, but you know, at least I have them. At least now I actually have copies of the first three books to go with the others. Never look a gift vampire book in the mouth because it probably has fangs and will bite you. The World on Blood by Jonathan Nassau. I've never heard about this one before. It's from 1996. The World on Blood was an awesome piece of work, but delicate too, sparkling like a spider web sprinkled with dew. Oh, when you get a book blurb that's in rhyme? It's gotta be good. Never before has an author portrayed the dark side of human obsession with such spellbinding authority, such vivid imagery, such haunting majesty, but that's exactly what novelist Jonathan Nassau has done with The World on Blood, a stylish, supercharged shale of eroticism and suspense. Ooh. This gripping thriller takes you into a world where innocent men and women alike are irresistibly corrupted, where newborn babies are kidnapped, and where blood is the ultimate aphrodisiac. It takes you into a world stocked by dazzlingly handsome and elegant James Whistler, master seducer, who finds his perfect partner an exquisitely beautiful Lourdes Perez, a cohort who matches his appetite for erotic expression. Is this a porny book? Huh. It takes you into a world shattered by the struggle between good and evil as Nick Santos, the one man who knows how darkly dangler Whistler is, puts his life and the lives of the women he loves and the baby he has just fathered on the edge of the abyss. As you do. And in a desperate race against time and seemingly omnipotent adversary, Nick battles mortal peril that has never been closer or more terrifying. Doesn't use the word vampire. Oh, but here at the bottom it says, Not since Anne Rice's interview with the vampire has the vampire myth been so boldly reimagined. Oh, someone else came along and reinvented the vampire. That happens so often. Here's a book about vampires and witches with nothing supernatural about it. It's deliciously nasty, too. Made me want to reach out and bite someone. Well, hot. The Angry Angel, which is a Sisters of Night book by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough. This is part of her series. It was going to be a three-part series about the three brides of Dracula. And I think 
Each bride was going to get a book, and then something happened with her publisher, and the last book never came out. It's never seen the light of day, and it's been a very frustrating situation for the poor author. Um, so I've heard things about that. I'm not sure if this is the first in this series, but it is part of that series. In Bram Stoker's dark classic Dracula, three weird sisters make a brief but unforgettable appearance. The beautiful mad brides of the vampire lord, their untold histories are at last revealed to us in Sisters of Night. Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough's brilliant reimagining of a timeless legend. In this, the first in a chilling provocative trio of novels, the acclaimed best-selling author carries us far beyond the grave into a breathtaking world of night and shadows with a hypnotic tale of seduction and slavery of fantasy in the flesh. Okay, so it is the first in the series. And the second one exists, but the third one never existed or something. And she can't even self-publish it because she doesn't have the rights to it. Um, I remember that being a big deal a while back. I don't know what's happened with it since. But I've always been curious about this because I love the brides in Dracula and I always want to know about their story. There's a lot of different kinds of books that reimagine it. We talked about a trilogy of that recently. And now I've got another one, just the first. I'll add the second one to my wish list. Slave of My Thirst by Tom Holland. It's got like a panther on a red velvet settee on the cover. And on the back is full of praise for his book, Lord of the Dead. I wonder if that's a vampire book too. Hey, it costs $5. A dazzling new masterpiece with a power and authority that evokes comparison to Anne Rice and Caleb Carr. Holland conjures a mesmerizing, ta mesmerizing tale of passion and possession that flows blood red through the lowest depths of 19th century London. Ooh. I love 19th century London. So gothic. Anything set there is great. Slave of my thirst. Natives shun the cursed road to Calix Sutra, but Dr. John Elliot is eager to join a top secret mission to the high peaks of the Himalayas. It means a chance to investigate a highly infectious brain sickness that destroys the mind, wastes the body, and shrivels the soul. And this man of science is doubly intrigued for the mysterious epidemic gripping Calix Sutra is shrouded in vampire lore. But the horror and decimation they encounter on those haunted peaks plague Elliot as he retreats to London. Burning with the guilt of a survivor, he devotes his days to healing the poor, until he is summoned by Lady Rosamond Mowbrilly to investigate the disappearance of her husband. To search for his old friend, Elliot must descend into the dark underbelly of London. It's a journey that will prove even more dangerous than his trek. Accompanied by Bram Stoker, whose observations would emerge in his immortal novel Dracula, Elliot plunges into a murky netherworld inhabited by actors, dissolute noblemen, and other denizens of the night. Reeling from the memories of the Himalayas, Elliot ultimately uncovers a temptation he cannot resist, the ravishing Lila, whose brilliance is as seductive as her bearing. Gleaming with icy beauty, lips as red as the venomous flower, she is the embodiment of bloodlust, and Lila will not rest until she has coaxed Elliot's most monstrous impulses into the open and unleashed them on an unsuspecting London. Wow, so Bram Stoker is a fictional character in this book about gothic London gas lamp vampire with a sexy lady seductress vampire in it. So I am both kind of intrigued and repulsed by the idea of this at the same time. Curious. Curious. This came out in 1996, so same as that other one. 1996 was a big year for sexy vampire books, especially ones that could compare to Anne Rice. Also from my mother's collection, The Last Vampire and Lilith's Dream by Whitley Stryber. These are sequels to The Hunger, and I don't have The Hunger, uh, but I've watched the movie The Hunger that it's based on, and I reviewed it a while ago. You should watch that if you haven't. But there were sequels. It was a whole series of books he wrote. Um, he's got three books here. So The Hunger is the first, Last Vampire next, and Lilith's Dream. And I think these tell sort of the backstory of the vampire Miriam character. They're not very big books, so I'm eager to read them. I've heard that her backstory is pretty interesting. I know she's supposed to be a very ancient vampire going back to Egypt, even though she's like super white, but we'll see. A copy of Romancing the Vampire sent to me by one of you. Thank you. I love this book. I've talked about it before, but this is the, a really cool book by David J. Skull, who is like one of the premier vampire scholars of our age. And it's got all these cool like flaps with like stuff you can take out and letters and pictures and postcards and fun things and art. I love this book. It is so gorgeous. If you can ever find a copy of this book, it is a must have for all vampire fans. Romancing the Vampire from Past to Present. Vampire pop culture completely encapsulated in one book. Thank you for sending me this. Love in Vain 2 
18 more original tales of vampire erotica, edited by Poppy Z. Bright, who also did Love in Vain 1. I guess that collection of vampire stories did so well that they made another one. Uh, this was also sent to me my my mother, so uh, thanks for the porn, Mom. This collection includes stories from such authors as Neil Gaiman, David Neal Wilson, Randy Fox, Lucy Taylor, Christopher Fowler, Sexy Vampires. It's got some vampire babes on the front. Of course, now I'm going to have to find a copy of Love in Vain 1 because, you know, I can't have just the second one without the first one. Thanks, Mom. And lastly, for this haul, also sent by my mother in that collection, the Vampire the Masquerade Redemption Official Strategy Guide. I've never played Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. I do play Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which you can watch on my channel. I've been playing it for like two years now. I'm almost done. Uh, maybe I should try Redemption after that. Now that I have the strategy guide, though, who's, who's excited for Bloodlines 2? That can't come soon enough. I have not heard great things about Redemption, but maybe if I played it, the strategy guide would help me. Yeah, I definitely need a new bookshelf. A big one this time. I was a fool last time and bought a small one because it kind of reminded me of a coffin. But it definitely was not the size to hold all my vampire books. Thank you for joining me in my vampire library. If you would like to send me vampire books, you can. That's a thing you can do. My P.O. Box address is in the description. If you just want to recommend me vampire books, though, leave me a comment. Let me know what I should add to my vampire wish list for the future, for when I'm able to shop, for when we're all able to go out and shop. In the meantime, I hope you're all doing well, reading lots of vampire books. If you would like to read vampire books with me, I am reading one vampire book a month from my library on my Discord server, and you can join me and read those vampire books with me. Or you could just join the Discord server or the Vampire Book Club just to listen to what we think about the vampire books if you don't actually want to read them along with us. I have posted two live stream videos on my channel so far about our discussion of, for the Vampire Book Club that you can go back and watch or stay tuned. Middle of the month, usually around the 13th, is when we have our live stream on this channel to talk about vampire books. The next book we are reading for the Vampire Book Club coming up pretty soon is Sunshine by Robin McKinley. Whether you read vampire books with me or on your own, happy reading. Until next time, good night.